So, hello everyone. So as shown before, I'm Deontay Hunter. And, I, and as part of my story of becoming unwoke, there were a lot of different authors and some videos that came as a part of a rabbit hole of my whole, I'd say, big part of my faith journey. So one of them is this book written by a man named Paul Johnson. And this book is Intellectuals. Little backstory on Paul Johnson. He is trained as a historian, and he used to be on the more politically left as far as England was concerned, because he's British. And after engaging with the realities of his field as a historian, he landed on a very different conclusion. And now he would be considered more on the conservative side by American standards. And part of his years of research involves intellectuals, which is going to be the focal point, which is this book right here. If you get like the paperback, it's a different color. But first off, Paul Johnson details about what intellectuals are in our modern sense. So if we go to the next slide, these are some of the quotes from the book on page one. Paul Johnson is not just a very effective historian, he's also a very good storyteller. So with that being in mind, I'm going to read a couple of these quotes. For starters, intellectuals can also be rephrased as opinion leaders or philosophers in a more modern context. And here's some of the quotes on page one of this book. Indeed, the rise of the secular intellectual has been a key factor in shaping the modern world. Referring to around the 18th, the 18th century, where you have the boom and enlightenment period and the changes that came from that. It is true that in their earlier incarnations as priests, scribes, and soothsayers, intellectuals have laid claim to guide society from the very beginning. Next part of the quote, for the first time in human history and with growing confidence and audacity, men arose that, to assert that they could diagnose the ills of society and cure them with their own unaided intellect. So what he's getting, what he's getting at in this first page of the book is as the rise of this idea that God is dead was circulating very much in a bigger scale throughout Europe and other parts of the Western world, the secular intellectuals kind of came in and I would say filled, tried to fill a void in terms of the priests, scribes, soothsayers, and so on and so forth. So why this made a big difference? One is it's a collection of biographies on the, some of the biggest intellectuals who still have a huge influence on today. It starts with a man named Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's credited as being the beginning of modern day intellectuals. And eventually the second person who gets a whole chapter to himself is of course Karl Marx. Now, as we go to the next slide, this is a picture of Karl Marx. And he is a very large portion of what I titled as when propaganda meets with reality. So for starters, Marx is credited as being a philosopher, but I'll get into detail what he more so was. And as far as how this has anything to do with becoming unwoke, the first thing is that the history of wokeness as an ideology has origins in postmodernism and Marxism, but it definitely has a huge influence that connects it to Karl Marx's philosophy. Because as I said in my previous talk, wokeness is, I'd say, the most fair definition on what, it's, on what people opposed to my view, conclusions would say, is being aware to the deceptions that the oppressors would use to keep the marginalized further marginalized. That was the most fair definition argument I was able to find. So in terms of what it more so is, it is a more modern interpretation of one a couple of intellectuals' conclusions, the biggest one being Marxism, specifically the idea of group-based group conflict. So with that in mind, with a little bit of context, we can get into the next slide. First, Marx's more accurate vision of the world. On page 54, there's very interesting research that, that Paul Johnson did on Karl Marx. One is that he was a poet or a type of poet. And these are some of the quotes from his poems that more so survived 
he ha his daughters had access to them, but most of them were destroyed, and they don't know where it is. So these are some of the ones that survived from, a news from an older newspaper. These are some of the main quotes from his poems that I found in this book. And I thought it really gave a good in-depth insight into what Karl Marx was really thinking about the world and himself. First one being, we are the apes of a cold god. Second, I show how gigant gigantic curses at mankind. And then he was also a huge fan of the play Faust. And in it, there's a character named Mephistopheles, which is like the play's version of the devil at that point. And Marx was very fond of using this quote often, saying that everything that exists deserves to perish. So Paul Johnson goes into detail where it talks about on page 54, and I'm going to quote this real quick. His poems he's referring to were entitled Savage Songs, and savagery is a characteristic note of his verse, together with intense pessimism about the human condition hatred, a fascination with corruption and violence, and then su suicide pacts and pacts with the devil. And, he go, and it goes more in depth as to Marx's more personal views that we now have access to, to a certain degree, because of surviving poems. So that's a little bit of Marx's his real vision on the world. Very apocalyptic, very depressing. Next slide, please. Now, the next question that I remember asking as I was rereading this was, Marx is known for a lot of things. One of them was advocating for the working class. So Paul Johnson asked the same question, and I wondered, how did he actually treat the workers of his era? So on page 60, as I've noted, I have a couple of quotes that I found in, very interesting. And here's one quote from page 60 to 61. First of all, the, referring to the workers of his era who formed the first unions over in England and a little bit of Germany because he kept getting kicked out of different nations in Europe. The, referring to the workers, they did not share Marx's apocalyptic visions. And above all, they did not talk his academic jargon because he was a very edu college educated intellectual for, for his time. He viewed them with contempt Revolutionary cannon fodder, no more, end quote. Next quote being, quote, Marx made sure that working class socialists were eliminated from any positions of influence and sat on committees merely as statutory proles or figureheads, end quote. So that was the next big, I'd say, shocker, for lack of a better term. There were a lot of other issues that are detailed in this book just on Marx. One of them being he would eliminate competing socialists from his positions of power. He was known for being extremely anti-Semitic. And well, that speaks for itself, because ethnically, he's also Jewish. His father was a rabbi. And basically, the other issue was that he was not good at handling his money. Part of his influence on why he hated the rich capitalists was partly because, as Paul Johnson finds out, he owed pretty much everyone money. So those people he owed money to happened to also be Jewish. So that fed into his anti-capitalist views was he was known as what we would call a debt dodger. And that was a big influence on his philosophy. And also his academic jargon didn't help his case either. So many other drama he got into. Next slide, please. These are some versions of, different versions of his more famous work. Das Kapital, or just Capital. There's more of an abridged version now, where you can get the whole thing in one, but it's even thicker than this book. And there's a lot of issues with that. One question he also looks into, was Karl Marx a genius researcher, as his legacy suggests? As we go to the next slide, Marx was very much known for lying, distorting, and falsifying a lot of his research. Now, biggest example here at the university, we are taught about academic honesty. If you're going to quote someone, quote them accurately. And academic honesty is a big deal here, rightfully so. That was not Marx's philosophy. As we see here, Marx actually lived to see his big thesis disproven. This is at this point in London, towards the middle of his life. 
his work was disproven as the worker's condition actually improved, not at the hands of, I'd say, workers' revolution, but actually because the more efficient entrepreneurs and capitalists realized that it would have been better to keep their workers if they improved conditions voluntarily. So that's exactly what happened. Marx's philosophy was proven wrong during his lifetime. However, he still writes in Capital that it got worse, even though he was called out for it. And then next point, in spite of these improvements, he continued to falsify quotes, use discredited data in his Das Kapital. And he was also known for plagiarizing a lot of other prominent socialists that came before him. Easy examples would be when he says, workers of the world unite, plagiarize that from a different socialist. Workers of the world unite, plagiarize that part. And there's a whole laundry list of what else he plagiarized. So that's just a very brief intro into the third point. Marx had contempt for God, as was seen in his poems. And as a result, he also had a contempt for truth and God's image bearers and humanity altogether. So that's, a, that's one, that's, I'd say, a very dark part of his life. Next slide, please. Another detail I actually wanted to bring up was that on top of his academic dishonesty, Marx actually had been disproven, not just in his time, but also later on. So I also looked into a couple of rabbit holes research that I did. And one of them was in regards to the question, Marxism has never been tried. Um, one of the things that I used to say when I was on the more woke Marxist side of things was the idea that that wasn't real Marxism because it's never been tried before. So that was an argument I made before. I've heard that myself in a modern context with other friends who were on the socialist side of things. So during the rabbit hole research, I found another interesting book. Uh, couldn't crop it right, but it's called The Black Book of Communism. It, authors originally from France, a couple of them, and it's basically what it sounds like, a whole documentation of the atrocities and crimes of every Marxist nation that has publicly claim they're Marxist and what actually happened versus what Marx's legacy suggests. So this is a little depressing that when I was doing the research into this book. So basically, the more conservative estimates puts the death toll up to around 94 million in Marxist nations. That includes North Korea. I don't think it includes Venezuela, because that happened a little bit later after this was published. So other different nations that publicly claimed Marxist doctrine as their sole inspiration for their legislation included Mao Zedong era China, Soviet Russia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and as well as North Korea. And a lot of those deaths were caused by methods such as man-made famines, because the reality is that when they try to redistribute different things like groceries, basically what happened was the government was not equipped to decide who needs what and who doesn't. So what happened was there would be long bread lines, assuming people didn't starve to death. And other thing were executions of political opponents. And if you really want to see in depth, there's a book that's been abridged from three volumes into one called The Gulag Archipelago. So that's an intense book, but it also shows what the Soviet Union did under their Marxist era. The last one was definitely death by labor camps. That happened a lot in Cambodia under the Pol Pot regime, which one of their mandates was anyone who wore glasses were considered part of the elites. So as a consequence, such as me wearing glasses, as a political strategy, we, anyone wearing glasses was sent to the labor camps in the countryside, and they were essentially worked to death. That's detailed in this part. So that's the first, well, not the first. That's the next thing I noticed, is that it's definitely been tried. And for those of you who are scientifically minded and you know the principle about experiments, in this case, as far as the record goes, in every single nation where Marxism was applied, regardless of the cultural, technological, and historical differences, the exact same outcome happened every single time. So just from this book and the details into Marx's personality, the reality is leading towards 
the idea that Marxism does not work when it's tried. Next slide, please. Next part, I found this funny just because this is a copy of the image of Communist Manifesto, and I saw a copy of that in Barnes and Nobles, so saw that a little bit humorous. And in, in this part, this is about how Marx never advocated for human atrocities. So I have in my phone a PDF of the Communist Manifesto, and I'm going to access that, if this works. <clears throat> so while I'm accessing this, I, wanted, I want you all to definitely pay attention to the specific wording he uses, because this is work that he wrote himself with Engels as his contemporary. And let's start with, what did I put? Ah, oh, yes, chapter four. Here we go. So this part is on the position of, communi of the communists in relation to the various existing opposition parties. Going to read a bit of a section. And the communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims for the enforcement of the mo momentary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. In France, the, ca the communists ally with the social democrats referring to democratic socialists, amongst, against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie, referring to the rich in a more modern term, reserving, however, the right to take up critical position in regard to phases and illusions traditionally handed down from the great revolution. That, to me, sounds like a lot of gobbledygook. So let's go more in depth as far as the next part, the course of this revolution. What will be its attitude to existing religions is the part I want to do that's very interesting. So this is from Marx's words. All religions so far have been the expression of historical stages of development of individual people or groups of people. But communism is the stage of historical development which makes all existing religions superfluous and brings about their disappearance. Now, what he's getting at is he very much advocated for the abolition of all religions. And, is, and in terms of whether that, that actually happened, in the first nation that claimed Marxism as their doctrine, Russia, the first thing they did was clear out the churches and any other religious groups. And the religious leaders, such as priests and other Christians, were either sentenced to death camps, executed, or tortured into signing a confession and it went even worse from there. Same thing happened in Vietnam after the US left. First people wiped out were Christians and whoever else claimed a religious loyalty. Next part is on part 21. What will be the influence of communist society on the family? So I found this interesting because it's very relevant to today. So I'm going to muscle through Marx's writing. It will transform the relations between the sexes into a purely private matter which concerns only the persons involved and into which society has no occasion to intervene. It can do this since it does away with private property and educates children on a communal basis. And in this way removes the two bases of traditional marriage, the dependence rooted in private property of the women on the man and of the children on the parents. So the short version is that the state, in this case the government, takes over control of raising your children. So I thought that was, very, that was definitely what happened in different Marxist nations that applied it, because the short answer, it was easier to take the loyalty of children and keep them loyal to whatever authoritarian was in charge. So that's usually the next thing that gets taken out is loyalty, family loyalties. And then here's the last part of Marx's manifesto. As an example, he follows it up with, and here is the answer to the outcry of the highly moral Philistines against the community of women. Community of women is a condition which belongs entirely to bourgeois society and which today finds its complete expression in what he described as prostitution. But prostitution is based on private property and falls with it. Thus, communist society, instead of introducing community of women, in fact, abolishes it. So 
That's a lot of gobbledygook, but basically what he's getting at, the differences between men and women and the morality that comes with it would also be abolished in Marx's, era, in Marx's utopian society. Now, what actually happened was different authoritarian governments basically wiped out those distinctions, and let's just say there is a lot of issues around what is a woman in regards to Marx's philosophy. So those are a few tidbits of what he wrote. If you want to see for yourself, you can find the PD, free PDF of Marx's Communist Manifesto. Or if you want some divine justice, buy it on sale at Barnes and Nobles. And then next slide, please. Ah, yes. So the next part that I found really interesting was Marx's idea, ideas are not main, mainstream. So I want to test that out and see, does he have any modern disciples running around? And I found an interesting video on a very prominent disciple of Marx's. The writer of the most popular and influential history book of the last quarter century was a radical leftist professor who despised his subject. The writer's name is Howard Zinn, and his subject is America. Zinn died in 2010, but his toxic theme lives on. America is and has always been a cesspool of racism, imperialism, and capitalist exploitation. You may never have heard of Zinn, but I assure you, a history teacher at your local high school or college has, and probably teaches his texts or ideas. The book Zinn wrote is entitled, A People's History of the United States. If you're trying to understand why so many young people lack patriotism or worse, regard America with contempt, you don't have to look much further than Zinn. Where did the idea that Columbus was evil come from? Lincoln wasn't really interested in freeing the slaves. The Allies weren't any better than the Nazis and the Japanese in World War II. The Vietnam War was not about stopping the spread of communism, but about promoting American imperialism. Zinn. How do you take an essentially decent country and turn it into the source of much of the world's evil? Well, you just have to lie, distort, and falsify. Zinn did all three. A lifelong and passionate leftist, everything he ever said or wrote was in service of the Marxist dogma that life is a class struggle. Distilled to its essence, this simply means that those who have power are bad and those who don't are good. Therefore, the downtrodden working class, the proletariat, are a heroic but faceless mass. The villains, the capitalist ruling class, in contrast, all have names and faces. They are the heroes of the nation, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Kennedy, and others. Zinn, as any Marxist true believer would, saw his task to tear down the latter and promote the former. But is such a simplistic approach really history? Noted liberal historian Arthur Schlesinger didn't think so. Zinn, Schlesinger wrote, was a polemicist, not a historian. As a polemicist, a propagandist, however, Zinn had few peers. Columbus turned out to be a perfect target. Before Zinn, Columbus was widely extolled for his foresight and bravery. Now, thanks to Zinn, he's considered a genocidal maniac. Zinn takes the explorer's ship logs and twists them to say the opposite of what Columbus clearly intended. In Zinn's distorted rendering, Columbus had contempt for the natives and wanted to enslave them. Read the explorer's observations in context and in full, and their true meaning emerges. Columbus had deep respect for the Taino and insisted that his men treat them well. Furthermore, he chronicled how terrified the Taino were of the neighboring tribe, the Caribs. For good reason. The Caribs not only enslaved the Taino, immediately and decisively refuting the idea that Europeans introduced slavery to the New World, but ate them. Yes, they were cannibals. Much excellent scholarship on Columbus had already been done before Zinn turned the explorer into evil incarnate. Not surprisingly, the picture painted by respected historians like Samuel Eliot Morrison was complex. Columbus was not faultless, but neither was the world he discovered a new Eden. But if you're preoccupied with propaganda rather than truth, what does it matter? It didn't for Zinn. 
because monsters change, but never their motive. More power for the capitalist ruling elite. Nowhere is this view more clearly expressed than in his discourse, the longest section of the book on the Vietnam War. In Zinn's view, it was just this simple. Mighty imperialist America bad, the North Vietnamese, the fearless peasants good. That the communist North Vietnamese slaughtered and tortured tens of thousands of South Vietnamese is not allowed to upset the equation. Again, Zinn abuses his sources to make his point. In one egregious example, he turns Foreign Service Officer Douglas Pike, actually a passionate defender of the South Vietnamese, into an admirer of the North Vietnamese. In fact, Pike believed what the North Vietnamese were doing to their cousins in the South amounted to genocide. I go into this and much more of Zinn's truth-bending in my book, Debunking Howard Zinn, exposing the fake history that churned a generation against America. But this much should be clear. A people's history of the United States has no place on a high school or college history curriculum because it doesn't teach history. All it teaches is hatred for America. Our students deserve better. I'm Mary Graybar, resident fellow at the Alexander Hamilton Institute for Prager University. That's a little bit of a video that I found as I was going down the rabbit hole doing extra research for this talk. So the next thing I found out in this next part is, I'm just going to go through real briefly, is Howard Zinn's ideas still have influence and in that not all, but some education professions still reference this link right here. And it's the Zinn Education Project. So. If there's anyone in the room who does have a disagree disagreement and say that Howard Zinn is a good influence, then I would recommend just looking at some of the resources here. And then you can go back to the slide. So that's basically the two things I wanted to show that is to show that basically Marx's views are definitely still mainstream. Not to say that all of the education system and all teachers are just bad. I'm getting at what the, what the video brought up is that history is very, very complex and requires more scrutiny than Howard Zinn and Marx were willing to show. So if anyone has any disagreements, I understand. And as we go to the next slide, the end of the book, as I got through all the different intellectuals that were covered, they all carried a similar theme to Marx, like even Leo Tolstoy was in there. Uh, James Baldwin was in there. That was very interesting and educational. So at the end, he talks about the lesson of intellectuals in terms of their collected history and the patterns that this particular historian noticed. As first quote, quote, one of the principal lessons of our tragic century which has seen so many millions of innocent lives sacrificed and schemes to improve the lot of humanity is beware intellectuals, end quote. And that, just, that doesn't just apply to intellectuals, but any particular influencer, whether it's on like right or left, that tries to engage in social engineering and c tries to speak for everyone else without their permission. So in terms of being fair, Go to the next, not, next, not yet. Um, the last quote is, quote, above all, we must at all times remember what intellectuals habitually forget, that people matter more than concepts and must come first. The worst of all despotisms is the heartless tyranny of ideas. As I wrap up, I wanted to hit home with this last quote and say that, after reading through that book, that showed me that ideologies are dangerous in a number of ways when they take priority over people. And so even though I have landed on the conclusion of being American conservative, I'm able to be more cautious and understand that I don't want to be a mouthpiece for anyone's ideology. I also have a deeper appreciation for being at the university setting because that's what Marx did not understand was the big part of being in a university setting and life in general 
is learning how to interact with people who don't think the way you do, so that way you can grow together. And I would say this was, the, this was definitely a big influence on my thinking and my political migration and my worldview change. And with that, I believe that is the last detail. And yes, regardless of which side of the aisle or if you're on no side of the aisle, I understand. And before we get to the q and I wanted to say thank you for attending this talk. And if anyone decides they still disagree with me, I understand that. And I appreciate the honesty. And with that, I hope you found this talk meaningful or at least educational. And with that, Thank you.